take a seat. Thank you, David. Um, it is interesting to think about the fact that uh, we've been here since 2013 um, when we moved out here. And um, let's see, how old were you, Jaden? He was in third grade. And now he's in 10th grade. Makes me feel really old. Some of you know the feeling, so <laughs> at least I'm not alone in that. Um, but it is cool because uh, Nicole and I have, um, often talk about um, where God has brought us and um, the path that he's put us on to come here and, and all of these steps along the way where he has just fulfilled um, what he has called us to and, and say he's fulfilled it because he's given us the ability to, to do it um, and uh, in our own selves we would not be here right uh, when we moved here we had a list of like 10 churches um, that and prior to coming here even though I had visited C4 uh, when I was out here on some business trips after I got the job um, I I had visited and I really enjoyed it, but I was like, I've still got to look at other places, right? Like I've got to do my due diligence, and um, and so uh, we had a long list, and it was every mega church in the area, and so uh, we came from a large church of a few thousand people out in Kansas City, um, and we were uh, I've told this many times we were used to slipping in the back door, and uh, hiding, and then slipping out before people could find us, right? Um, you know, last song, we were out the back door, you know, pick up Jaden, run to the car before anybody could say hi. Um, and so out here, we had a, a long list. It was like, I think Sherry Hills was on the list. And these are all churches that I listened to their teaching. And I was like, okay, I, I can get down with this. Let's go visit and see what it's like. And um, Sherry Hills, and there was, man, I don't even remember all of them. But there was a whole bunch of them. And, um, and we show up. And there was a crew of people uh, from this fellowship who actually came, uh, Wallenberg coordinated them, came and helped us move in uh, to our third floor apartment. Uh, how gracious is that to help somebody you don't know move into a third floor apartment? Um, and we weren't used to the altitude. And so I'm certain that they, Scott was there, Matt was there, I think uh, Corniotis, Chin, I don't remember who all was there, but um, I'm sure they did all the heavy lifting. Um, I don't remember exactly, but we were winded the whole time. And so we were going much slower than everybody else. Um, but then after two weeks of visiting C4, Nicole and I were like, we, this is it. Like it was so different than anything we had experienced in church. Um, people actually cared. People actually loved each other. Um, and it was a small fellowship. We were in the little strip mall right around the corner. Um, the three-room church. We had the sanctuary, the garage where the kids were, um, and the office where the nursery was. And I think there was an office with a desk in it that nobody ever used. I think that's where you guys prayed. Oh, they used it for discipleship. So... Um, but super small, and, and then we, you know, we were, so we were with the church when we moved here, and uh, that was awesome to see God move. But it's just amazing to see the steps that he's put in place along the way. And now we look back, and we're like, wow, we've lived in our house longer than we've ever lived in a house in any one place. Um, and um, we now, I mean, in as far as in our married life, we've been married 15 years, uh, and we've been here seven I mean, that is sort of mind-blowing to me. I'm like, wow, this is crazy, uh, because Denver really is home to us now. Um, but this this fellowship is home to us, and uh, the people here, the pastors, um, you know, are truly my brothers. You know, Scott and Chin and and um, Matt and Trafon and Aldo and, I mean, and, and Matt and, I mean, Kirk. I mean, all these guys are, are men that have surrounded me and encouraged me um, all the men in this church, and so um, I'm grateful for everybody here, um, especially because, you know, M Wallenberg pushing me, and Corniota is pushing me, and those guys are are the reason that I, you know, that I started praying about 
you know, what what the whole worship thing. Like I I was not down with doing worship, um, and and God used them as instruments to uh, lead me down that path. And now it's an amazing what He's done. Um, so it's just man, I'm so grateful. I don't even. I could probably talk all morning about that, but I'm not going to. Um, if you turn to Luke 10 um, first, and we're going to wind up in First Timothy, so I'm going to flip around a little bit, um, but if you don't like to flip around, you can just go land in First Timothy. We'll be there eventually. Um, but first, go to Luke 10. Um, we're going to look at uh, verses 1 through 3. And it's interesting because I taught on Sunday... And um, my message was really about being used by God and, and following the calling that he's put on us. Um, and uh, we talked about how the Israelites uh, that came back from Babylon did that, right? They, they moved into something they weren't even aware. Of. They didn't even know what, really, really what they were getting into, right? They hadn't seen Jerusalem, but they were being called back to Jerusalem to go rebuild the walls. And so they did, and they followed God's prompting to go do this thing that they had no idea what it was, right? Um, and so this is very much, um, I would say, a follow-up. Um, I lead a, a Saturday morning Bible study at Milano Coffee. So Trafon has one at, at Legends Coffee um, out by Southlands. And then I lead one over here. Uh, it's just across from um, Home Depot. And we just started uh, 1 Timothy last week. Um, and it's the way that I do the study there is, or I should say the way that we do the study is, it's interactive. So it's, it's um, we study together the word. Right. So it's not um, just me talking, although sometimes I start going and they don't tell me to shut up, so that's their own fault. Um, <laughs> Brent goes, so you should really tell me to shut up every once in a while. Um, but uh, the idea is that we go through it together. We study through it together. And so some guys will have a, maybe a commentary open on their phone or something like that and start to dig through the scriptures. Um, and we started First Timothy, and I was like, wow, oh man, First Timothy might have to make it into my message. Well, then I was reviewing my notes Saturday afternoon, and I was like, no, I'm not putting First Timothy in there. Uh, and then Scott asked me, hey, can you teach next Saturday? And I was like, huh, yes, I can. We're going to be in First Timothy. So... Um, you know, appreciate the opportunity, brother. Um, it's it's a it's a privilege. So, um, but looking at Luke ten, uh, verse one, we see it says, "After these things, the Lord appointed seventy others also, and sent them two by two before His face into every place and or city and place where He Himself was about to go." Then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among the wolves. It's an interesting thing because, I don't know about you guys, but when I read the Bible, I often fall into this trap of not recognizing that more went on back then than what's written on these pages. Right? We only have a microcosm of what God did in that time written down. Right? Jesus was with these men for three years, day in and day out. He spoke a lot with them. They ate dinner together, right? They lived together. They traveled together. Um, and if you've ever been with a group of guys that you live and travel with, or or at least you maybe go on the retreat with guys, or, or you just have somebody at some point in your life that you were traveling, uh, you know, extensively with, you know you start to get to know people really well when you travel with them, right? Uh, their quirks and their downfalls. Sometimes maybe their downfalls are more obvious probably because they're your own downfalls, right? But we start to really get to know these people. And so I fail to think about the fact that the disciples in Jesus, they knew each other really well, right? And, and there was so much that was happening in those times. Um, and, we, and we just fail to think about that. But we also, I, I also fail to remember that it wasn't just Jesus and the disciples, 
he had the 12 that were super close to him and that he was imparting this wisdom on and they were traveling with him and ministering with him. He had three who were super close to him, like uh, the inner sanctum, right? They were, they were the ones that were like truly, truly with him all the time. And then they had others who were also following and others who wanted to do the work and who God had called to do the work. Right? It wasn't just these 12 men who went out and did God's work. It was the people that were impacted by Jesus as they met him in the cities. As he would travel around, as they would hear the teaching, as they would see the healings, as they would uh, see this, this man who, who was being called the Messiah, who proclaimed he was the Messiah, as they saw him come into town and, and then they'd see and they'd see what he had to offer and they'd realize how different it was. And then they'd come to know who God was. And then they'd go and they'd do God's work. right? And here we see there's 70 at this point that he sends out. 70. And he sends them out. He says, go. And, and uh, you know, when the, in the end of Matthew, we see the great commission, right? Go and make disciples. And so he says, he's telling them, go out into these cities and we're going to come along. We're going to follow, follow you. But go out and prepare the way. And it's interesting because uh, we find in, in ministry that oftentimes, and, and this is to be very honest with you, oftentimes people expect that it's the core group that's going to do the ministry. Right? Well, we've got the pastors and we've got deacons and we've got worship leaders and we've got people that are on staff. They're going to take care of everything. It's good. Right? We just let them do their thing. But what we don't realize is that God has called all of us to do the work. He's called every single person to do the work, to come alongside the Holy Spirit in the work of God, right? He, it's not just he called Matt, Pastor Matt, right? And then Matt happened to meet up with Chin and Scott and Trafon and, and David and you know the guys that are here on staff and you know, that's the crew, right? God has called every single person that comes and sits in these seats. He's called every single person that goes and sits in a church down the road, right? Calvary Aurora or, or you know, there's Encounter Church over here. There's, uh, I don't even know the name of it. I've driven by it a hundred bajillion times. Fellowship Bible on Parker Road. I drive by every time. Grayson really wants to go there. I don't know why, but he every time we drive by, he's like, I want to go to that church, right? Um, I think he just thinks the building looks cool. I don't know. But... Um, and for the, I think maybe only one or two, you know, F Grayson is my four-year-old, so. Uh, <laughs> Jaden's our big kid, Grayson's our little kid. Um, and, and so it's interesting because uh, we do get stuck in this, in this mindset. And I was there, I've been there in this mindset that, yep, the people here, the guys that are serving on Sundays, the, the folks that are making this happen, they got it. I don't need to be involved, right? I was like that when I was in Kansas City. I, we probably had a home group, but that was the extent of our involvement. Like we went, we would go every Sunday evening, we would meet with these folks. That was the extent of it. We weren't serving, we weren't, you know, we weren't actively involved in anything because we just thought, well, you know, we weren't called to that. Well, little did we know, we were called, we just weren't acknowledging the call, right? God was calling me. God called me to worship from the time I was born. He knew I was going to do worship before I was made. And it took me until I was 30 years old, 31 years old, to recognize that. You know, it's something that we have to step out. Because as, as, as Jesus says here, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. And pray, therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Right? We have laborers. We have people to do the work of God. They just have to step up and do the work of God. Right? And that means me. It means you. It's every single person. We have to do the work of God. He's called us to it. And so when I think about that, well, that makes a weird noise when you do, when you move your hand over there. Sorry. Squirrel. Real quick before I go on, verse 3 there says, Go your way, behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Wow. Thanks, Jesus, for the encouragement. Right? That makes you feel really great about where you're going. Right? 
I'm going to send you to wolves. But the fact is, is that um, going out and trying to tell a whole bunch of sheep to be sheep doesn't get you very far, right? They already know how to be sheep. Sometimes we need to go to the wolves so that we can turn them to sheep, so that they can see the right way, so they can acknowledge who God is in their lives, and they can turn. So, uh, very interesting. But first, uh, first Timothy, we see Timothy, and I, I love this uh, this story about Timothy or, or the the life of Timothy, because he's somebody that I think we just sort of glaze over as we study the scriptures. I mean. Um, you know, you can find commentaries on Timothy, but when you think about books that you often hear at conferences and big impacts and things like that, um, I mean, First Timothy, unless it's like a pastor's conference, other to- other conferences, you don't see a lot of First Timothy being taught. Um, and I mean, maybe I just don't hear it, but I'm sure it's being taught some. Um, but I think we just sort of glaze over who Timothy was. Um, but I want to look at Timothy this morning because I think we see a lot of who Timothy was and what God has called us to do. Um, and so, let's take a look at Timothy, a um, couple verses to get us there uh, before we get there. But we, when we think about Timothy, who was he, right? He was a man who was involved in ministry very heavily with Paul. And so, Timothy, his name actually means honoring God. That's, or, or precious uh, to God, but the the most common translation of it is is honoring God. And this is a man who grew up um, in a split household. His mother was Jewish, who turned Christian, so she was a Messianic Jew. His father was Greek, and so that would make him a mogul. I knew my son would like that. Um, those of you who don't know what that is, it's a Harry Potter reference. So sorry. I don't know if that's what you get to do from the pulpit, but whatever. Um, and uh, he, he was—he was a, uh, as, as the Jews would be concerned, he was a half-breed, right? He's not a legit Jew because his father was Greek. You know, he wasn't born into a Jew, what they would consider a Jewish family, because his father wasn't Jewish. And so uh, you can imagine he probably grew up in a really bit of a weird household, right? I mean, for his mom to marry his father, um, she might not have been a very heavily practicing Jew. Um, Otherwise, she would have married a Jew. Uh, But she marries a Greek. And so, um, you know, I can't imagine what what his raising up was like. But what we do see an indication of is that he was, his mom was saved, probably influenced by his grandmother. And he started learning about God from a very early age. So, you know, we don't know when in his childhood did his mom get saved and when did he start hearing about God. But we just know that he learned through his mother and his grandmother. He didn't learn through his father. So he learned of Jesus through his mom and his grandmother. He he saw the faith through them. And they were his example, not his father. What a sad story. Right? And those of you who have children, we need to be the example in our kids' lives, right? Not the bad example in our kids' lives. We need to be the positive example. We need to be the ones influencing um, the way that they view the world by shaping their worldview and helping them understand what God has called them to, right? We need to do that as men uh, leading our families. And so, um, you know, we see in Acts 16 um, where Paul... Uh, sort of picks up Timothy, and they meet him in in uh, Derby slash Lystra, um, and it says, "Then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium." 
Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were at the region or in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. So uh, Paul knew that the that the Jews in the area were going to start questioning Timothy, and so he suggested that he get circumcised because of who he was going to minister to. He didn't request it because it was a requirement for salvation. He requested it because he knew that the way to open the door to the Jews was to have that be the case, right? Have that be done. And Timothy had a good, strong conviction, and he did it, right? That's something that is important for us to think about and keep in mind is that he walks, uh, he knows he's going to go minister to the Jews, so he prepares himself to minister to the Jews. We need to prepare ourselves to minister to the people that we're going to minister to. Right? That doesn't mean if you're going to minister to people who, who are on drugs, it does not mean go, <laughs> go get on drugs and then prepare yourself to minister to them. No, that's not what that means. It just means make it, prepare yourself so that you can be accepted by them. Right? Walk into that situation knowing that there may be things about you that trip them up. Right? When I go and... Um, I'll you know, occasionally go lead worship at another church. I, in the questions that I ask the pastor or the, the worship leader is, does, do people in your church have an aversion to tattoos? And if the answer, I haven't had them say yes yet, but if the answer was yes, I would wear sleeves. Because I don't want to be leading worship and then have folks in the fellowship just completely thrown off by the fact that I have tattoos. Right? It's, it's something that I'm just conscious of, I'm aware of, because I want, the God, I want the Spirit to be able to use me. I want God to be able to use me unhindered. I don't want to walk into the situation and immediately throw people off. Right? So um, it's something I think we need to be aware of and think about as we go out and we minister. So Timothy has a long history here. He travels with Paul. Right? They, they meet up in Derby. He travels with Paul to Macedonia, Philippi, Thessalonica, um, Berea. He stays in Berea with Silas, from what we can tell um, in, in the Bible and in, in church history. Uh, he stays with Silas. They then go and they join Paul in Corinth. And um, chances are he was actually with Paul when Paul wrote the book of Thessalonians, when he wrote the letter to the Thessalonian church. He was with Paul at that point. And so um, he was then sent uh, to Macedonia with Erastus. He was sent back to Corinth. Um, we believe he then joined Paul again in Macedonia. And he went to Rome or was in Rome for a time when Paul was there during, Rome, during Paul's first visit to Rome. And so we see that Timothy wasn't just a guy who appeared on the scene in Ephesus. He was a guy who had been involved in ministry, weaved throughout the time that Paul was on his ministry tours, right? Or whatever you would call them, missionary tours. And so um, here we have a man who's very experienced in ministry. Um, and it's interesting because he gets sent to these churches. He's like a fixer, right? Some of you may know what a fixer is. Right? You send them in to solve the problem, right? And, uh, and that, that's almost like what's happening with Timothy is that Paul says, you know what, they're having problems in that church. Send Timothy. He'll go line it out, right? Uh, so he clearly uh, was a man who, who followed God and had God um, well planted in his heart. He returns from Rome and is assigned to Ephesus where uh, as we read the book of Ephesians, we see that the church in Ephesus had some challenges uh, that they were dealing with. And so Timothy was assigned to, to lead there. And then Paul winds up back in Rome and in 2 Timothy 4, uh, verse 9, we see that Timothy is asked for. So Paul says... And Paul's writing this letter his second time in Rome, which um, if you follow church uh, history and, and the history of, or if you are aware of the history of Paul, this is right before Paul dies. Um, so he writes this letter and he says, Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica, 
Grecians for Galatia, and Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And and Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come in the books, especially the parchments. Interesting. So he's saying, bring some things to me. He, he sent somebody, he sent this Tychicus to Ephesus to go replace Timothy. And he says, hey, he's on his way. You come, come to me and, and bring these things. Bring the parchments. I wonder what's on those parchments. Right? You, letters, maybe? I don't know. But it's cool to think like he, there was something valuable on that parchment that Paul wanted and that Paul felt like he needed. And it's interesting because he asks for Timothy to come back and it is highly likely that Timothy did return to Paul. So Timothy returns to Rome. He's with Paul there in Paul's final days and uh, church tradition would state that he was probably likely there when Paul was martyred. So imagine, here he is, He's been following in ministry. He's been serving God. And he goes and he's there uh, when his mentor uh, and the man who led him into ministry uh, is martyred. That's intense. Right? And then he, he heads out and he goes back um, to Ephesus where he served out the rest of his days. They say that they, they estimate that he probably died around 97 A.D. Um, Paul died around 68 AD, 68, 70, somewhere in that time frame. So he served a long time then in the church of Ephesus after that. And he was actually, um, he was killed be, because he took a stand against a uh, celebration for, you know, they say a pagan god, probably Diana or something like that that was happening in Ephesus. And he stood against it and he said, no, this is wrong. You shouldn't do this. And the mob killed him. Right in about 97 A.D. So here we have a man who who is definitely involved in ministry heavily. He uh, he knows Paul very intimately. Um, he knows who Jesus is. He knows who uh, who God is, and and he has seen what God has called him to do in ministry, and that he's been going out and serving at all these different churches. And he gets called. Um, he's he's called into Ephesus, and it's very interesting in the first epistle of Timothy what we see is Paul begins his letter. And so, uh, I'll try to blaze through this one. I actually put in my notes to uh, Scott and James, praying for God to extend the time. Um, <laughs> so, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. A couple th things really quickly here. One, He's an apostle of Jesus Christ, right? He's a messenger of Jesus Christ. He says, by the commandment of God, right? It wasn't that he was an apostle because he just wanted to be, because he enjoyed what God was doing. No doubt, I'm sure Paul gained joy and peace and comfort through the ministry. But he was called as a command from God. And I think this is where we mistake ourselves in ministry. We don't recognize that what God has called us to, He commanded us to. Right? He has commanded us to serve. He's commanded us to follow after Him. He's commanded us to lead. He's commanded us to, to live a life for Him. Not just asked, if you feel like it, then maybe come follow me. Right? He commanded us. And I think Paul grasped that. I just don't think that we grasp that very often. I know I certainly don't. Um, sometimes I feel like it's optional. And he says, Our Lord, our Savior, and Lord, our hope. And I think this is interesting because here Paul was in Rome. He was in prison on his first time there. And he's talking about the hope who is Jesus, right? And that is what hope is. Uh, we can get that hope um, if we follow after God. Charles Spurgeon says, the stability which the anchor gives the ship when it has at last obtained a hold fast is like that which the Christian's hope affords him when he fixes itself upon this glorious truth. 
With God is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Look not to thy hope, but to Jesus, the source of thy hope. Right? Spurgeon understood that the hope, that anchor in Christ, is what provides us the hope. It's what gives us the ability to be steadfast in hard situations. It's what gives us the ability to work for him as we go through ministry, as we go through our time with, uh, in our relationship with Christ. And I think it's important for us to recognize that uh, Paul clearly did. He says to Timothy, a true son in the faith. You know, at this point, they knew each other well. And for Paul to recognize you as a son in the faith would have been a great call. Right? That's huge. Because the fact was that they had gone through so much together. And Timothy had been faithful through all of that. Not just to Paul, but to God in doing what he had called him to do. And he says, Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. And this is something um, last week um, Alex pointed out that I thought was, was really good. That Guzik puts in his commentary, he points out that oftentimes Paul greets people with the words grace and peace. But in this epistle, in First and Second Timothy, and then in, in Titus, he greets them with grace, mercy, and peace. And uh, the fact is, is that when he's talking, when you're talking about being in ministry, you need to have mercy for people, right? It's something that, yeah, grace and peace is nice, right? We we get grace uh, from God because we that we definitely don't deserve it, right? And we have peace that we find in Him and the hope that we find in Him. But as we minister, as we serve, we need to have mercy on other people because it's very easy for us to come down on people. It's very easy for us to go, well, why don't they just get it? Right? And those of you who have served the children's ministry, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Right? I don't know why the eight year olds don't get it. Like it's a challenge. Why can't you just be quiet for five minutes? Right? Uh, <laughs> some of you are chuckling heavier than others because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but we have to have mercy for those who are around us as we minister. We have to have mercy on them. That's what God has called us to. God has given us mercy, hasn't he? He could have struck us dead. He should have, right? But he gives us mercy, and he doesn't. And so here we are. Uh, he greets him with grace, mercy, and peace. In verse 3, he says, As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. And this is interesting. He says, stay in Ephesus. Why did he say stay in Ephesus? There must have been a reason. And we talked about this last Saturday. I wonder if Timothy didn't want to stay in Ephesus. He'd been there before. He had worked with this church body before. And he knew how challenging it was. And maybe when they had conversations and Paul said, hey, you need to go back. Timothy goes, oh man. Ephesus? Can we go to Corinth or something like that? Ephesus? You know the troubles we've had in Ephesus? You know the problems that they have in that culture? You know the problems they have around the church? You know, the city stopped them from meeting in the school. You know, the city won't let them put their sign out on the street. Lamos. Right? Not that our city has that problem, but I've, I've talked to pastors. That, that is their problem. Like, the city says, you have a three-hour window where your sign can be out. Whoa. Okay. Right? Like, that's crazy. And... And it would be easy to go, well, there's too many complications here. Let's just not do it. Let's just hold off or let's go to the next city over. But God needs his word to be taught in that city at that time. He's called you to that thing for a reason. He's called you to, to lead your family for a reason. He's called you to lead in this church and, and to teach and, and to, uh, to carry your ministry forward, not in, in the convenience of ministry, but in his calling. Right? Um, and so I wonder if, if Timothy was, um, was maybe feeling pressure. He, he didn't want to be there. Right? 
I don't know for sure. We can't we can't exactly tell, but um, it's an interesting thought. In Romans sixteen, Paul says, uh, verse seventeen. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord. Right. So he tells them, "Hey, look out for these people in if, if Ephesus that are, qual- you know, they're they're arguing about silly things. They're teaching other doctrines. They're doing these other things that are that are not necessary for." for salvation and they're taking the ship down with them and he's saying charge them charge them that they teach no other doctrine right they need to stick to the doctrine stick to the word of God that's why we that's what we do here we stick to the word of God right you will not find a pastor in this church or a teacher in this church who doesn't have a bible and is not teaching from the bible I mean, I think we've all been to a church before where you get through the entire message and then they have like the last five minutes they mention one Bible verse and everybody's happy, right? It, was the message based on the Bible or was the message based on you know, pop psychology and then they threw in a Bible verse to make it sound legit, right? We've got to focus on the Word. If you don't focus on the Word, you're never going to know when the false teaching comes. You've got to be able to discern it and the only way you can do that is by going to the Word. This problem wasn't um, wasn't just isolated to Ephesus in Second Corinthians um, chapter two, verse eleven. He says, Paul says, um, "Wow, well, I typed that wrong. I put eleven through four, which is definitely not the case." Um, but. Uh, I don't remember which verse I was looking at there. We're going to skip to the next one. Galatians 1, 6. It says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed, as we have said before. So now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. And it was a problem in Galatia. It was a problem in Corinth. It was a problem in Ephesus. It's a problem in our church today. Not in our fellowship, but in the church as a whole. It's a problem. And so we have to be aware of that. And we have to speak out against that. And, and no doubt this got Timothy discouraged. If he's the only one there who's saying, no, stop, you can't teach that. That's not right. That's not what God said. If he's the only one, that might have gotten him discouraged. Maybe that's why he, he was like, oh, I don't know. I'll go somewhere else. And Paul's like, no, stay in Ephesus. They need you there. Right? They need you uh, to guard the gospel. So in verse 5, he says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. I love the three parts there. Pure heart, good conscience, and sincere faith. Right? We need to have a pure heart in the way we serve. We need to keep ourselves in a good conscience in the way we serve and in the way we walk in our lives. And we need to focus on having a sincere faith. And you grow a sincere faith by getting in the Word, by having a relationship with God, not just by being at church every once in a while. Right? You grow in faith in your relationship. Your, your faith becomes sincere as you see God move and you see Him walk, uh, walk before you in things. And you go, wow, that's amazing. God, I see what you did. That's amazing. And then your faith grows and it strengthens. And as you see God work in other people's lives, and then your faith grows and it strengthens. And then as you see a bad situation come up, and then it turns around and you grow and you strengthen. Or you go into a bad situation and the only 
recourse you have is to turn to God and say, hold me. I need you. And in that moment, your strength and your faith is strengthened. And it becomes sincere as you turn to God in those times. And so he's calling us in that sincere faith. Romans 13, 8 through 10. We see Paul talking about love. He says, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet... And if there is any other commandment, all are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Galatians 5, verse 14, says, For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. And we need to love one another, not devour each other. Right? And so here, Timothy's been called to a ministry where he needs to love people. He needs to stand in the way of false doctrine in such a way as to love them. Well, that's a challenging situation, right? People say, well, how do you do that? Well, you don't post it on Facebook. Right? All that does is cause division and cause strife. You go to the person, you follow the biblical model of approaching somebody about a, a sin in their life, and you, you follow that model and you honor God in addressing that issue. That's how you do it without devouring people. But we are to be on guard in that. And then in Matthew 22, Jesus, in his own words, says that love is the greatest commandment. Matthew 22, verse 34 um, through 40, he says, it says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Right? It's on that. It's love. love is where it all sits. Without love, and we've talked about this a lot recently as we've uh, gone through math studies, um, love is where everything starts. You've got to love other people. You've got to walk in love uh, as you walk in ministry, as you walk in the calling that God has given you. First Timothy Chapter 1, verse 6, he says, From which you have strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. And so here they had teachers, people in the church that were teaching this false doctrine. All they wanted was to be a teacher. All they wanted was to be the one giving the lesson. They didn't want to actually live it out. They didn't really have a foundation in, in God. And they didn't know what they were affirming nor denying, right? Like they, they didn't know because they didn't have a, a strong foundation in Christ. And so he calls Timothy to go and to stand in the way of that. Verse 8 says, But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and the profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. And if there's any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed, of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust. The law is there for us to see how far we've strayed. Right? If we were perfect, why would we need the law? Right? If we were perfect, why would, why would God have had to put out the law? 
if we could provide salvation for ourselves. You see, God has given us this law. He's given us the commandments, the law that he wrote to be a gauge, right? It's like your gas gauge in your car. Is it full or is it empty? Are you following the law or are you not following the law? Where are you at in your life, right? We all know that feeling of the right versus wrong. And, and we have that. It's inherent within us because God implanted that in us because we're humans and and we need to recognize that. And so that's what the law is for, right? It's not for perfect people. Because, I mean, you know, if you ever achieved that point, well, let me know. I'll probably tell you you're wrong. You're lying at that very moment. But it's it's one of these things that we have to understand that that law is, is there as a gauge uh, to tell us where we're at. And so Timothy's been called to this ministry. It's a hard ministry. It's not an easy thing to do. And as we think about the fact that Jesus says the harvest is plenty, but there's workers are few, a lot of times I think the workers are few because the ministry's hard. Right? They talk about the fact that there's pastors all the time. Like, I don't even know the statistic, but it's always crazy when I hear this statistic. It's like 1500 a month or a week or something crazy like that. Pastors who are leaving the ministry because it's hard. And because the, the church is not thriving, right? It's, people aren't growing to know who Christ is through their ministry. And so here they leave the ministry but God has called them to that ministry now maybe there's some out there that weren't called to the ministry and they're just trying they certainly aren't trying to get a buck from it all of them some of them are they should come work for us for a while salary is awesome but it's one of these things that he's called them to a ministry that's hard and he says encourages them says stay there I know there's false teaching you need to stand in the way. You need to tell the people that that's not right and you need to keep them from teaching that. Show them the truth, but do it all through love. And as we think about going out in ministry, whether that's ministering at home to our families, whether that's being at work and being an example for other people, whether that's ministering here in whatever facet, cleaning the toilets or, or uh, watching the... I almost said cleaning the children. Um, <laughs> Yeah, oh, I'll tell you, some days, some Wednesday nights, you'll wonder. Um, <laughs> that worship room gets a little funky every once in a while upstairs. Um, but, but no matter what he's called you to do, whether it's worship or, or teaching or, or having a home group or, or anything that he's called uh, you to, if you don't know what it is yet, just start doing things. Just start serving. Step in and fill the gap because we have lots of gaps. Right? Our ministry has lots of gaps, lots of places where people are pulling triple and, and quadruple and decaduple, I don't know what you call it, you know, ten time, whatever. I don't know what what's the appropriate term, do you know? De sounds good, decaduple. Um, <laughs> so, so it's, you know, we have gaps and we have places for people to serve, but we have people who think, well, I can't serve because I haven't been called. No, nope. eh, wrong, you've been called. God has put you here for a reason. He hasn't put you here to look pretty. At least not most of us. Uh, he's called us to do His work. And so, even though the ministry's hard sometimes, ministry's hard. Right? Our pastor knows that more than anybody. And the amazing thing is, he doesn't ever look like it. He makes it look super easy. But it's hard. And God has called us to walk in that hard ministry. Maybe ministry at home is hard. God's called you to walk in that ministry. Maybe ministry at work is hard. God's called you to be in that ministry. And that doesn't, you know, people go, well, I can't, I'm not allowed to speak about God at work. Well, are you loving the people? And I said that Sunday. Like, that's, that's a huge thing. Yeah, most of us have like ethics boards and all these other things that keep us from saying certain things or, or whatever it may be. But if that conversation comes off the clock, have at it, man. But how are they going to ever know to ask you if they don't see you living differently? That's huge. And so 
the ministry that he's called us to is difficult, but it's where we find hope. We find hope in what God has called us to do. Right? So if you if you're down recently, if you're you've been feeling like you just don't know what to do and, and you just don't know where God has put you or God has called you to and you're like, I just don't know what I can do for him and um, I guess I'm just going to just chill. Um, pray and get involved. Because right? God has called everyone to ministry. He's called us all to step out. And this is a core group, right? This is, I mean, you guys all came to the men's breakfast, the other ones that you should shame for not being here. Um... But he's called us all. And so, you know, I don't know where that place is in this fellowship for everyone here, but there's a place, I guarantee it. Right? Guarantee it. So. Father, we love you. If you like today's message or were blessed by it, be sure to like and subscribe now and become part of our community. Also, help spread the great news of Jesus Christ by sharing this message on your social media accounts like Facebook, Instagram, so that your friends and family can be blessed as well.